my allergic reaction. This is not a difficult chapter, but there's a couple of key elements that you're going to have to know. When you leave here, I want you to be able to spout those back to you. So we're going to get those tonight. You're going to need to be able to identify a patient having an allergic reaction. And we're going to look at the difference between just your old run-of-the-mill allergic reaction and a big-time serious allergic reaction. The big time serious allergic reaction is this word. What is that? Anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis. That's right. We're going to look at how to treat that, how to identify what it is, and then how specifically to treat it. And we're going to look at our epi auto injectors. Uh, we kind of looked at those the other night. We'll do that in the lab next time when we're around there. Okay, allergic reactions. What is the most uh, likely cause of an allergic reaction? What causes allergic reactions? Yeah, there you said it. it is something they ate, but it's not like a food item. It's medications. So medications cause more allergic reactions than anything else out there. I know that's shocking to you, but it's the truth. Uh, with allergic reactions, the immune system naturally wants to get in there and fight off any foreign substance. That's just what it does. So with an allergic reaction, the body overreacts. It doesn't just like take care of business, you know, like in a TIA, it responds and breaks up that clot, you know, and everybody's happy. Here it overreacts and starts doing more than it should be doing. An allergen, this is terminology, an allergen is a substance that causes the exaggerated effect. I put a little nut down here. My brother's allergic to pecans. That's a big offender. You guys know you came through school, you know, you can't have any nuts at school. You can't take a peanut butter jelly sandwich to school. Okay, your reactions to allergens. Usually, on your first exposure to it, the body starts um, developing antibodies to it. So then the next time it's exposed, it recognizes it and it takes care of business. That's what it's supposed to work. <coughs> antibodies found only with the allergen they were formed to respond to. Yeah, so It'll identify that specific allergen, and next time it should take care of business. Should. But typically, you're not going to have a response for the first time they're exposed to that, okay, in a true allergic reaction. For those of you that are visually oriented, this is a pollen issue. I don't like that picture. Doesn't mean anything to me, though. Okay, your second or subsequent exposures, if the body. Um, the antibodies already exist from the first time that they were exposed. And as the antibodies get in there and combine with the allergen, then we're going to have a release of histamine and some other things that help mediate that nasty old allergen thing. Sometimes these chemicals, though, that are released by the body uh, as part of the exaggerated response can be very, uh, very harmful for our little bodies. The effects of histamine, you'll see swelling. It's like, have you ever been stung by a bee? Anybody in here? Somebody in here has been. What happens? It swells, it itches, it gets red. All of those are gonna be signs of an allergic reaction. But they're things that your body should be able to manage okay. Sometimes you'll have some bronchial constriction, you know, where, if you think about it, the body doesn't want anything nasty in there. So it's gonna take steps to protect itself. Bronchial constriction, while that is not good for the body, if you're breathing in an allergen, the body's going, no, no, not in the lungs, I'll die. That's creepy, I know. <laughs> so you get vasoconstriction because of that, because the body doesn't want that in there. So vasoconstriction. Well, once you get vasoconstriction, now what happens? Help, Mr. Bell, I can't breathe. Yeah, that one. That's funny. It's okay. It's going to be a long night. Um, the, uh, the flip side of that is you're going to have vasodilation. Remember earlier in the semester we talked about what happens when you vasodilate, you're really diluting the blood, right? You're spreading it over a wider surface. So with, uh, when you've got an allergic reaction going on, you've got a foreign substance the body wants to, you know, lessen, then it's going to vasodilate to spread that over a wider surface so it's not as concentrated. Does that make sense? Another thing happens is the cells become permeable. They begin to leak. That's awful. So you get this little fluid transfer there. This is, uh, that can be quite problematic also. 
Now, anaphylaxis is going to be that very severe, life-threatening allergic reaction. Different than I got stung by a bee, I have a rash, it's swollen, it really hurts me because I'm having an allergic reaction. You know, uh, I can't eat um, Brussels sprouts because it makes me sick and I get nauseated. That's not allergic reaction. I mean, that's not anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is what's going to kill you. I don't think Brussels sprouts have killed anybody unless they like choked on it, which I would probably choke on it. So anaphylaxis is going to be severe. Anaphylaxis can kill you. Y'all ever know anybody that's died from allergic reaction? Somebody you know? I mean, a relative? It was the mayor. The mayor? He was outside here and I showed him he was moving down the belt. He was moving in. Oh, he's probably dead right there, wasn't he? Like I said, they count the fifty of these things. Yeah, he died. Yeah, it can be very serious. In fact, most deaths from anaphylaxis occur within the first thirty minutes. But the quicker that the response presents itself, uh, the more serious it is, typically. The two components of anaphylaxis that you have to know are these: hypotension. The blood pressure drops. You get a very widespread vasodilation. The, the blood pressure turns to nothing. And or respiratory distress. In most cases, you have both of these coexisting. However, you can have anaphylaxis with no respiratory distress, only the hypotension, or you can have the flip side of that. You can have anaphylaxis where you have severe respiratory distress but the blood pressure doesn't, doesn't drop. But those are the two things you're looking for. Either one can indicate anaphylaxis. Typically, you're going to see both of those. So if you don't have any respiratory distress, you don't have any hypoten uh, hypotension, then you don't have any what? Anaphylaxis. Okay. Dilation of the blood vessels, airway swelling, bronchial constriction. Yep. Not good. Common allergens, I mentioned that medications are the most common. Beyond that, we've got insects, foods. What are the foods that most commonly cause anaphylaxis? Nuts, nuts, nuts shellfish, right at the top of the list. There are other things. Yeah, I don't yeah. Um, plants can cause anaphylaxis. How about the jellyfish thing? Mm -hmm. It can, it's unusual, but it, but it can. Uh, so there are a lot of different things, and we're actually encountering an uptick in things that cause anaphylaxis. And we have a lot more uh, events of anaphylaxis now than we ever have in the past. A lot of reasons for that. One thing we're seeing more commonly, too, is going to be latex allergies. You know, back in the olden days when I started this, there was no such thing as a latex allergy. But now, we cover ourselves in latex. If you're in healthcare, you're putting that crap on every single day, 20 times a day, I probably shouldn't say crap. Erase that, I didn't say crap. Um, so you need to be aware that you can have an allergic reaction from latex. And it can build until you be it becomes anaphylaxis. You may have patients, uh, say you have a patient with some, uh, that has, has a chronic disease, they have to all put gloves on to you know, change different uh, equipment, they may develop a, a latex allergy. So you might get in the habit of asking the patient, you don't have a latex allergy, do you? So they've actually changed a lot of the equipment that we use where they've taken latex out of it for that reason. Okay, mild, a mild allergic reaction can progress pretty rapidly. Uh, so you may have that bee sting and, and at the beginning it looks okay, within about five minutes, you know, you've got swelling all the way down the arms. What do we call it when you break out those little rashy things? Hives. Um, that's hives. What's the A word that goes along with that? Uh, a word. The U word. It's a vowel, but wrong vowel. Uticaria. I thought some of you guys would know that. You, I think that's probably right. Uticaria. So if you see that on a test, you're going to know that's associated with uh, hives, pretty much. A severe reaction usually takes place immediately, but 
it can have a slightly delayed response, up to as much as 30 minutes. But usually the more rapid the onset, the more serious it's going to be. And you just never know. Um, if, if you know somebody, if you've had a, a mild allergic reaction to a bee sting or a food that you ate, and then the next time you're exposed to it, it gets a little bit worse, you better know that that third time may kill you. So a lot of your patients, a lot of people that you know probably carry EpiPens. Any of you guys know anybody that carries an EpiPen? Mm -hmm. Yeah? That's just you? Yeah? So my brother has one. Um, so which is a good thing. Mostly now they come in like a dual jet, so they'll actually have two, two doses of that, which is important. Um, we talk about epinephrine later on, we'll talk about that specifically. Can you even see that little guy's face? Sure, that's much better. So signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction, a lot of swelling, redness to the skin. Is it raining out there? Oh, cow. Someone's window's down in the truck. Yeah, I was just looking right there. It's all back here. A white, I saw some white trucks when they were down there. I'm sorry, I digress. The skin gets... Like this one. Yeah, yeah breathe. The skin gets red, kind of feels flush, it's going to feel hot. Um, they may report kind of a tingling, a warm tingling feeling throughout as they start to vasodilate like that, so their capillaries start to get leaky. They may feel kind of warm and tingly all over. See, I spelled it wrong, left out the R. No one caught that. You can carry it. I wondered about that. Okay, oh yeah. This is hives. With hives, they're, they're, they're flat or just a teeny little bit raised. They're not big old welts. Uh, we actually call these wheels. That's a stupid word. W-H-E. Don't quote me on that. When I moved into Does that spell right? Does have an A in there? What you say? When I moved into my new apartment, the very first night I was there, I took my shower at night, and when I got out of the shower, I had stuff that all over me. Yeah. Like every was it the soap? No, I used everything I used at night before you got my other apartment. Oh, they cleaned the I, 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 I guess. Yeah, good job. Um, other things that you'll see, here's, uh, can I just not spell? <laughs> Close your boat side. Y'all come here doing great. I can't find it. There's no yeah, okay. well, there has to be a spell check. Do what? There has to be spell checks. Not for that word. Mm. No? Yeah. I think it does have an R. But anyway, angioedema, that's going to be this. It, you pick up that word edema, right? Yeah. Angioedema, this is eutocaria. They're here. Hives. What? It does have an R. Did I spell wheels right? Oh, okay. All right, your signs and symptoms. I already told you. What are the two things we're looking for? Hypotension, respiratory distress. So respiratory things you're going to see. First off, your patient's going to report tightness. As those bronchioles constrict, they're going to feel that tightness in there. Uh, it may feel tight in their chest also from that constriction. They may start coughing. Why do you think they're coughing? Air actually gets trapped in the lungs. You, know, you breathe in and it kind of starts to constrict. Coughing is a way to help evacuate that air. Uh, the respiratory may become rapid, labored. You may actually hear some uh, wheezing in there as they're struggling to breathe as their airway closes. Uh, they may have swelling in the larynx, so that's going to affect the vocal cords, so they may uh, be very hoarse. They're not going to have a lot of uh, strength in their voice because they're not moving much air. They may not be able to speak. You may hear strider if there's upper airway involvement there and wheezing. Um, we're going to look at the different si uh, systems here. If you've got anaphylaxis, you're looking at something that's systemic. If you have an a allergic reaction, you're usually looking at something that's local. 
got stung by a bee, it hurts, it's swelling, it itches, you know, maybe gave a little rash, but that's going to be localized. With uh, anaphylaxis, you're looking at something that's systemic. So you're going to see involvement of pretty much all of the body systems. And first off, you're going to become tachycardic, right? Why? My blood pressure just dropped to the floor, so you're going to be tachycardic. Decreased blood pressure. Your patient's going to become shocking because why? My blood pressure just dropped to the floor. Yeah. And, hey, I can't breathe. So now I'm not perfusing well. The eyes become itchy and watery. The nose starts running. Part of that is going to be the permeability of the cells, but part of it is the way the body gets rid of the nasties. Does that smell that way? She's looking. Oh, it's good. I'm going to come closer to the door. Um, so, and this is a combination of the chemicals that are released uh, that cause that, that itchiness. Um, they'll usually report a headache, you know, because there's no oxygen and blood in my brain. I'm going to get a headache. Feeling of impending doom, where does that come from? Can't breathe. Can't breathe. You know, there's no perfusion. The brain's not getting enough oxygen. It's not getting enough blood. So, yeah, they're going to have that feeling of impending doom. Like your cardiac patients. You know, if they've got a severely uh, decreased cardiac output, they're going to get that feeling of impending doom. Okay, anaphylactic shock. You're going to eventually see altered mental status because they're not getting enough oxygen. The skin may be flushed, dry, or it may be cool and clammy. It just really varies. Because with anaphylaxis, you've really got two different things going on in the body that are sort of warring with each other. Nausea and vomiting, not uncommon. You know, when the body's under stress, one of the first things it's going to do is cut off blood flow and oxygen, or decrease blood flow and oxygen to the uh, gastrointestinal system. Vital signs changes, become tachycardic, respiratory rate picks up, blood pressure drops. Okay, the hardest thing for you probably is going to be those borderline cases, deciding is this anaphylaxis or is this just an allergic reaction. And because patients are what, the D word, what's the D word? Dynamic. Patients are dynamic, they're changing. So initially, you like that one? Initially, they may have a mild response. Remember I said you can have uh, death up to 30 minutes later from severe anaphylaxis. Well, something's happening during that 30 minutes, right? They're going to be getting worse. So they're going to be going through some stages. So your job is going to be determining when they get to that point where, ooh, we've got anaphylaxis. We're going to have to do something. So watch for either respiratory distress or signs of shock. One, the other, or both. ABCs, we talked about that. You're going to get a history from your patient. Some patients are allergic to just about everything on earth. So for them to be, uh, to have anaphylaxis, or they probably have a bunch of things that cause anaphylaxis. But they're going to have EpiPens too, because they don't want to die. You want to know what they were exposed to. You don't always know. I've had a couple of patients that are showing very obvious signs of severe allergic reaction. It's like, I haven't done anything. I haven't eaten anything. Just like you described. What did I do here? Yeah, I, I, I was like, you had anaphylaxis and you don't know why? I don't have anaphylaxis, but like, I got the hive busted out everywhere. And just, yeah. I don't. I went under the same stand I've been going to, the same routine, the same kind of stuff I always had, and then just sitting there. Just breaking out? I was sitting there watching TV, just la la la, and all of a sudden I'm looking around, oh my gosh! Yeah. What's it called when you get tested for? Like, let's take all the needles in your back. Let's do allergy tests. Hey, don't make me back to do it. Okay, let's move along. We'll be here all night. Make sure what your signs and symptoms are and watch for the progression. You're watching to see if your patient's getting any worse. That's part of your reassessment, right? That's why we do that. <coughs> Excuse me. You want to find out if they have done any interventions. Have they taken anything or done anything to reverse it? What would you commonly expect your patient to do if they had a bee sting or something? They're going to take Benadryl. That's diphenhydramine. So that's always a good idea. But diphenhydramine will only have an impact on part of that allergic response. The other side of it, if it's anaphylaxis, you're going to have to have epinephrine. 
Okay, your treatment is going to be ABCs right down the line and decide if, whenever they're breathing inadequately, you're going to have to bag them. Consider assisting the patient if they have a EpiPen. So that's one of the first, if you recognize they're having an allergic reaction, do you, excuse me, do you have an EpiPen? Yeah, where is it? Let's get it. Usually it's pretty close at hand. What are you going to have to do before you assist a patient with their EpiPen? Call, call before I call, what am I going to do? Got to make sure I've got a set of vital signs because they're going to say, are they hypotensive? Uh, I don't know. I didn't check the vital signs. What's their respiratory rate? Oh, I don't know. I didn't check that. So make sure you get a set of vital signs and do your, a good assessment before you call. If the patient is not wheezing or showing signs of respiratory uh, distress or shock, go ahead and do your assessment. So if there's no respiratory compromise, continue with your assessment you know, until you get your vital signs and get your blood pressure. When uh, use of iron may be appropriate. If the patient knows that they have contacted something that they know they have a severe allergic response to, then you want to go ahead and get all your ducks in a row and, and get ready to make that call. Because they've got history there. So the first time they're exposed to something, typically you don't see allergic reaction. It's the second time. So they may have been exposed a few times. So you want to get the history about that. They've got respiratory distress or signs of shock. Get your stuff out. Uh, after you've assisted with the auto injector, and we haven't really gone through how, did we talk about how to do that in the lateral aspect? Okay, we'll do that in the lab. I thought it was in our chapter. I must have missed it. Um, the auto injector is going to go into a large muscle. It's going to go in the, in the outer part of the thigh here. And when you hit it, you're going to hit it with some a little bit of uh, speed here and pressure, and you'll hold it there for probably up to 10 seconds because it's got to release that epinephrine. Uh, if your patient is has such an altered mental status that they can't assist you with that, I'm probably going to wrap their little fingers around there and we're going to do it together because otherwise uh, they're going to die. All these patients will need to be transported. One thing about epinephrine, it has a short, uh, short half-life, which means that it will be um, uh, metabolized and gone from the body in a very short amount of time. Well, an anaphylactic reaction doesn't go away as fast as the epinephrine goes away. So you may have to give additional doses of epinephrine. So your patient may be very serious. You're going to give them epinephrine, and everything's good. They start clearing up, and then 10 minutes later, they have this giant relapse, and they're right back where they were. Uh, so you'll need additional epis. If your patient only has the one EpiPen and you administer it, uh, I'm going to call ALS back up so I can make sure I have some more epinephrine. After you use the epi, you're going to hopefully watch your patient uh, get a whole lot better, but continue your reassessment because, and continuously reassess because you may have to administer more epinephrine. Remember, you have to call med control before you give epinephrine. There's, you, if your patient is fixing to die, you're going to have to give them this epi pen. But if they're one of those borderline cases, and they're a 65-year-old man who's had, you know, cardiac bypass, he's had three heart attacks, and he's got a lot of dysrhythmia issues. Giving him epinephrine will probably kill him. So unless he is like in severe respiratory distress, uh, you probably want to avoid that. So that's one of the reasons that you're going to call med control. Just you can get some really good advice before you kill somebody. Uh, don't call him after you kill him. Okay. If they don't have any EpiPens, then you need to call ALS back up ASAP. And you will treat them for shock. How do we treat them for shock? Yeah. Oxygen, keep them warm. Uh, you may end up elevating your legs, but position them certainly. Should you administer an auto injector for a simple allergic reaction? That would be no. Okay. Uh, epinephrine is a very potent hormone. The side effects, remember we looked at epinephrine that caused you to become tachycardic? We talked about that, didn't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It causes the increase in contractility of the heart. It's going to increase cardiac output, makes you tachycardic, makes you all jittery, that kind of stuff. So there are some, 
serious side effects that you want to avoid if, uh, unless you really need it. What assessment findings would indicate that they need epinephrine? Hypotension or severe respiratory distress, that's right. And epinephrine acts on both of those. Epinephrine is a potent vasoconstrictor, which is what we want if they're real hypotensive, right? If they've vasodilated, then that's going to cause that. The other thing it does, it's a, a, a bronchial dilator. So it's going to cause the bronchial to dilate. So it's going to treat both of those things, which is always good. Epi will go through here. It's a naturally occurring hormone produced by the body. Constricts blood vessels, dilate bronchioles. Side effects, increased heart rate, increased cardiac workload. You're putting a greatly increased demand on the heart. And you don't want to do that, you know, if it's not getting enough oxygen, if it doesn't need it. So you're only going to do it if you need it because of the side effects. These are a couple of EpiPens here. I think one is the junior. Did I give you all the dose of epinephrine? Did we talk about that? 0 0.3 milligrams is the adult dose. 0 0.3 milligrams is what's in the adult uh, EpiPen. In the pediatric EpiPen, it's going to be half that dose. So what's that going to be? Yeah, 0 0.15. I was checking my math guides here. 0 0.15 milligrams. And it's a flat dose. It's not based on milligrams per kilograms or anything like that. So it's 0 0.15 milligrams for adult, 0 0.15, uh, did I say it wrong? 0 0.3, 0, 0 0.3 for adults, 0 0.15 for kids. It's going to be in the anterior lateral thigh, right here. If you put your hand here, it's going to come just about where your hand would go. Mid thigh on the outside. If you can, take the, remove the clothing from that area, but if not, it'll go right through the clothes. No problem. Take the cap off. I'll show you this in the lab. Here, I'm not sure if this is patient assisted. Anyway, you'll press the tip firmly against the body there, and you'll hold it in place because it takes it a few seconds for, that, uh, for the epi to go into the body. So you'll hold it in place. And then once you're done, you'll pull it out. And what do you do with that little toothpaste? Sharps. Sharps container. Absolutely. There are two sizes, an adult dose. Oh, good, I had that in here. Children's dose, usually they're uh, 66 pounds or less. Important thing I want you to know, anaphylaxis is a true life-threatening emergency mm -hmm. that will kill your patient. Most common symptom early on is going to be itching. If it's anaphylaxis, they're going to have what? Hypotension and respiratory distress. So if I give you a scenario and I give you their blood pressure and I say that you hear wheezing and they're not able to talk very well and their blood pressure is 90 over 70 and they've been eating pecans, what are you thinking? Anaphylaxis. What do you want to ask them? Do you have an epi pen? Yeah. They say yes. Then what do we do? Yeah. Get it. You've got to make sure you get your vital signs right. You got to call med control. Okay. Make sure. That's a tough one. Yeah. In that event, I'm calling med control anyway. Say I've got one here. It's not prescribed for this patient, but here's what how I know it's anaphylaxis. It probably is it. I'm not going to let a patient die because it's not prescribed for them. Okay, what if you're at a restaurant and someone in the restaurant had it? Well, you still got to call med control yeah. anyway. Okay. Yeah. I'd ask them, they'd probably say yes. If you can convince them that it is anaphylaxis. Uh, if a patient has anaphylaxis, they're going to be freaked out. Lack of oxygen to the brain. I'm fixing to die. I've been here before. You know, probably had anaphylaxis before, and it scares the wits out of them. Other signs you may see, we talk about vasodilation, bronchial constriction, le leaky capillaries, and they also will start developing uh, some thick mucus in the lungs. That takes a little bit longer to occur. The key here is recognizing it and acting immediately. You know, if you walk up and you spend 10 minutes doing your assessment, your patient's going, ah, oh, I'm going to die here. You know, kill somebody. Okay. Y'all know this. Y'all got
going to go back and read all this, right? Mm -hmm. you got to be able to recognize the difference between just an ordinary, run-of-the-mill, garden variety, allergic reaction, and anaphylaxis. It's a big deal. You need, before you use that EpiPen, you got to think about the impact it's going to have on your patient. You know, you want to do the greater good here. If you've got a guy that's fixing to die, he can't breathe, he's turning blue, he has no blood pressure, and he's got cardiac history, guess what? You're getting an EpiPen. But if he's able to talk to you and he goes, you know, this happened before, and I remember my voice got all like this, are you going to use the EpiPen? No, I'm going to wait. It's going to be a wait and see thing. I want to do it closer to being at the hospital. Okay. Signs of symptoms associated with each um, system. What are you going to see on the skin with anaphylaxis? Uh, Redding, hives, warm. How about the respiratory system? Constriction. You may hear wheezing. Strider. Yeah. Weak voice. Cardiovascular. They're going to be tachycardic, right? And uh, hypotensive. <coughs> Okay, 24-year-old 20, male ate a meal that he believes contains shellfish. He is allergic to shrimp. Why'd you eat that? He's sweating and nervous. He appears to be breathing adequately. You don't note any wheezing or strider. His face is slightly red. His pulse is 88, strong and regular. Respiration is 24, blood pressure 108, 74, skin warm and moist. Should you give him the epi? Yeah. No, respirations are good, blood pressure is good. Leave well enough alone. Okay, how are we doing? Yeah. Are y'all staying awake for us? Are you taking this information?